Um, Professor Van Dyke specializes in a number of um, interesting areas, constitutional law, international law, the law of the sea, and native, um, native rights, as well as other um, human rights issues. Uh, Professor Van Dyke has um, consulted with a number of Pacific Island nations, as well as teaching in Japan, so his knowledge area and work really expands into the entire Pacific Basin area. And um, what I've uh, been really lucky to work with him on is um, Native Hawaiian land issues. And he wrote a book that was published in 2008. It's called Who Owns the Crown Land Hawaii? And it kind of goes through the long um, history of Hawaii's public land press and the rights that that has created for Native Hawaiians and um, has generated a lot of really good conversation in Hawaii about political recognition for Native Hawaiians, which is something that has been on the table nationally since 2000 and um, will hopefully be resolved um, sometime in the near future. So you'll learn more about that today. So thank you very much for being here. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Elena, for that very gracious uh, introduction. They, the, uh, one of the important things about Sherry is that she is a graduate of this uh, law school. Mm -hmm. and, uh, main claim to fame. Um, and uh, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to talk for the first half, and then she's going to talk uh, for the second half. And um, the focus of the talk is going to be on uh, a, uh, a case that, that Sherry was the lead attorney on for. Um, 14 years uh, trying to get a moratorium on the uh, public land in Hawaii. Uh, so uh, she'll be talking about that case, which went to the U.S. Supreme Court in, in more detail um, during her part of the uh, talk. And I'm going to try to provide some um, historical background. Uh, I know some of you are very familiar with, with Hawaii, and perhaps others are not. I, I didn't uh, know anything about Native Hawaiians when I first went out to the Hawaii uh, 35 years ago, and uh, so I, I wanted to sort of set the stage and then we'll talk more about the, the legal issues. So Hawaii, of course, is a, a beautiful uh, archipelago of islands that's uh, located uh, about 3,000 miles uh, southwest of us here, and um, it's part of uh, what people call the, the Polynesian Triangle, the Polynesian people. Uh, extended up to Hawaii, over here to Easter Island, and down to uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and then uh, lived in the area within that. Um, and the Native Hawaiians lived uh, a self-sustaining uh, existence, isolated existence, until uh, 1778 when uh, Captain James Cook came to Hawaii, um, and, uh, and Westerners started coming. But uh, the Native Hawaiian culture has uh, survived and is, is still strong in many ways. Um, and they're one of the largest uh, groups of indigenous people in the United States, but they're the only large group of indigenous people that have never had either a, a, some kind of settlement with the federal government or a claims commission established uh, within which they can pursue their claim. So they've been left out of the uh, progress that many Native people have, have made in our country. Um, before uh, Western contact, they were skilled in, in, in many ways, great navigators, uh, traveling these vast distances in the Pacific. Um, Hawaii has a perfect climate, so they didn't you know, build uh, elaborate uh, houses, but they did have these huge uh, temples that, that they constructed for religious purposes. And, and of course, they were skilled at the hula and, and, and chanting and made beautiful feather capes. And, they were very skilled at fishing. They uh, developed surfing and introduced that to the world. Uh, they uh, had, had elaborate uh, ceremonies and, and dances. And um, one of the things that I personally find particularly amazing is their uh, aquaculture. They were able to uh, develop fish farming in a way that uh, is very complex, and we, don't, we still don't even understand exactly how they did everything that they, they did, but, but many of the fish ponds are still around and, and we're trying to restore them and, and, uh, and reuse them. Um, before Westerners came, the Hawaiians uh, had a sense of, of um, uh, connectedness with their environment. Uh, they didn't make a distinction between living and non-living things. They uh, had uh, 
their uh, creation stories uh, linked themselves to the plants and to the environment. And they, they felt this uh, connectedness that the uh, environment they were in were part of their ohana and, and part of their community. And the, the, the land, which they called the Aina, uh, was not something to be bought and sold. It was something to be nurtured, to be protected, to be developed. <coughs> and if you took good care of the Aina, then the Aina would take good care of you. And uh, they, they viewed uh, their, their land and their resources as part of their extended family, and, and it would have been a disgrace and inappropriate to engage in, in buying and selling of it, like you, know, you, you don't buy and sell your, your brother or sister, so you same way you don't buy and sell your, your land. Now, um, until pretty recently, Hawaii was still a, uh, a self-sustaining subsistence place. This, this picture here is from the um, early uh, 1800s, uh, not so long ago. Here's the way Honolulu looked in 1853. Uh, just a, a small village. Uh, you can see here the location of the current uh, Iolani Palace, uh, which was a previous building. And then even as late as uh, 1875, when this painting was done, you can see that there's, there's virtually nothing in um, Honolulu. But uh, today, of course, it's a megalopolis uh, with skyscrapers and stuff. But there's still Hawaiian communities around the islands that, uh, that are, are living in tra traditional ways uh, and, and want very much to continue living in those uh, traditional ways. And the Hawaiians are, are restless. They um, very much want uh, uh, a change in their status. They want to control lands and resources. And um, in the last few years, uh, year after year, there have been marches, protests, uh, uh, enormous outpourings of uh, people on, on different issues that have come up, uh, and um, uh, we have a, a festering, unresolved problem that, that, that needs attention. Here, uh, sometimes they protest in their own unique, special ways, uh, and uh, and these these protests uh, continue and continue. Now, I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the. Uh, the way land uh, changed uh, from the uh, pre-contact period to the present. And uh, the most important moment was uh, the Mahele, which means division, which took place under Kamehameha the Third um, at a time uh, of, of great turmoil. Hawaii had been taken over in the early 1840s by a uh, British uh, uh, admiral and, and uh, Europeans were coming around the Pacific grabbing islands uh, without restraint. And so King Kamehameha was very concerned that uh, the Hawaii, which of course is the real prize in the Pacific, would be claimed by um, one of the imperialist powers. And so he tried to figure out how he could keep at least the land in Hawaiian hands, even if the sovereignty were somehow lost. And so he thought that if he transferred the land from this sense of common ownership, to private property that the, the Western imperialists would respect that. Uh, whereas if it was all commonly owned, they would just claim everything as the new sovereign government. So he uh, went through this several year process to transfer the lands from public ownership to private ownership. And during that time, various principles emerged that uh, guided the process. And the basic idea is that there would be a division of the lands into thirds, sometimes it's, it's fourths, uh, depending on how they were characterizing it. But the, the king would, would keep about a third of the land. Then the main chiefs, the elite, would keep another third. And the common people, the Makainana, would keep the, uh, another third. Uh, sometimes the, the government would get a, a, fair, uh, a share as well, so sometimes it would be thought of as fourths. But, but in any event, the common people were, were always intended to get uh, at least a fourth, and perhaps a third of, of all the land. Um, but as the process unfolded, the, the common people got uh, squeezed out for the most part. So the, the king uh, did wind up with about a million acres out of the 4.4 uh, the million acres in the islands. The Ali'i took a million and a half acres during the allocation. The government received a million and a half, and the, the common people received 28,000 acres. Um, so uh, less than 1% of the 
the land uh, instead of the, the one third or one fourth went to the, the common people. Uh, now, the, the king first uh, managed his lands as sort of as private property, bought and sold them and, and mortgaged them. Um, but after a few years and after a couple of transitions uh, among the royalty, the legislature passed a law in 1865 uh, saying that these lands, the, the king's lands, which became known as the crown lands, <coughs> should be um, uh, not alienated, not uh, subject to any transference, uh, because they were supposed to, to serve the, the, the monarchy, to serve the crown. Um, and so that was that was accepted as of 1865, and they were managed uh, uh, by a commission uh, for the next uh, 28 years until we get to the the overthrow in 1893. So uh, the United States uh, participated actively in overthrowing the Kingdom of Hawaii, working with the uh, Western settlers in the islands. The United States had a, a big warship, the, the Boston, as you see here, that was in Honolulu Harbor uh, for for several years, there were previous warships, but the United States was, was always very um, much in, in presence there. Uh, this was, you know, one of our um, best modern uh, warships that went on to fight in the Spanish American War in the Philippines. And um, in 1893, uh, January, uh, the Marines landed from this. In this picture, you, you can see the, the Boston back here in the background, and, and you see the, the Marines uh, landing. And they uh, went into Honolulu, took up positions, making it clear that they supported the, the Western settlers and opposed the Queen, Queen Lili Kalani and um, uh, supported uh, a transfer of uh, a regime change of the, of the government. Um, here you see them at the, uh, uh, the uh, what's now the Hawaii Supreme Court, Ali uh, Alani Hale, obviously there to intimidate the government and make it clear that, that, uh, that there is to be a change. Now, the queen then does abdicate, but she doesn't abdicate to the, the Western settlers. She abdicates to the United States, thinking that once people back in Washington realize what has happened, that they'll return uh, the kingdom to her. Uh, and, uh, and, and as it turned out, the president of Grover Cleveland uh, sent an investigator out, James Blunt, during the, the summer of, of 1893, and he did uh, conduct an investigation, and he did think that uh, that the U.S. military and the U.S. Uh, diplomats had acted improperly, and, and Grover Cleveland uh, releases this proclamation, and in December of 1893, he's saying that there was an active war, a very strong term, a substantial wrong has, has been done, which the whole regard for our national character, as well as the rights of the injured people requires we should endeavor to repair. And so he did want to restore the, the monarchy and, and the kingdom, uh, but uh, met resistance from Congress. And we had then the same sort of gridlock that we have now with Democratic president, uh, Republicans in Congress. And so nothing happened over the next um, few years uh, and, and in Washington. Um, but uh, in Hawaii, they, the, the white settlers set up a, an interim government called the Republic of Hawaii. Uh, and then in, in 1898, when William McKinley uh, became president, uh, Hawaii was finally annexed uh, by the United States. Now, um, the Hawaiian situation uh, fits into a broader uh, scheme of, of rights of indigenous people, and we've, we've seen just in, in the the last couple of years, finally, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People uh, promulgated by the General Assembly is a very important uh, international document. Um, originally, uh, four countries voted against it, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States, but, but all four of them have now said they support this declaration, which is uh, an enormous accomplishment. And uh, President Obama said that the United States supports this uh, as of December of 2010. Uh, this uh, uh, declaration clearly recognizes the, the separate and distinct status of indigenous people and, the, and their rights to, to live as, as separate and distinct people and to control their, uh, their lands, their traditional lands and resources. Um, well, the annexation took place uh, in 1898. Um, the, um, 